Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio sign KE0OG. Here is another episode of the Commentariat, the weekly commentary on the comments. Today is the 3rd of May of uh, 2023. Spring has sprung, at least tentatively, here and there. Uh, we've had some very, very nice days. It's currently 70 degrees outside, so very good. Okay, let's jump right into commenting on the comments. This first one, which came an hour ago, was, uh, let's see, Fi Atlas, Fi at last, Fi at last, Fi at last. Uh, okay, and this is on uh, an ant- a vertical that just went up on uh, looking at the inverted V, specifically looking at the effect of the central angle on the inverted V using uh, the EZNEC 6 Plus software, which I own. Uh, th- that software is free now. Uh, you'll actually get a better version of it free. The uh, owner of the software has uh, uh, retired, and that also means that the software will gradually go out of date as he is not maintaining it, but it still works perfectly for what it's doing. Um, Fiat Last says, the peak gain at the optimum takeoff angle may decrease. Um, Actually, I thought it increased, but the signal level at high angles increased and increased substantially. You know, what he's trying to tell me in this is he said, in fact, he says, be careful. It's hard to draw conclusions when comparing antennas. I'm going to draw all the conclusions I want, okay? Um, what I'm just simply showing is what happens when you take a dipole and start to droop the ends into an inverted V. The classic instruction for that is 120 degrees central angle. Uh, but I also went ahead and included 90 degrees and 60 degrees just to see what would happen. And the bottom line is that while you slowly degrade the performance, you um, actually find out there isn't that much difference. And the bottom line is don't be afraid to put up an antenna because it's not perfect, okay? Just just go on ahead. Um And keep in mind, unless there's loss somewhere in the system, all the power you put in the antenna gets radiated somewhere. That is not true. Um, There are ways that you can increase the ohmic resistance of the antenna. In other words, instead of being radiated as RF, it's radiated as heat. So, uh, okay. You know, if you were to take a, uh, a, a clothes hanger and load it up on... 80 meters, would you radiate? Yes, you would radiate. You really would. You might even get a contact out of it. But it's a horrible antenna. So I'm just going to tell you I stand by my video. Okay. Um, Mark uh, Blockinger, KN6YVC, says, Dave, nice video on the inverted V. What about the inverse, the V dipole? You know, if, if you put it up like this. I've seen a lot of buddy poles uh, do that sort of thing. I have not modeled that. I guess there's no reason I can't. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what would happen. I, I'll go ahead and model that. Uh, Juango Perez says, um, Juan Ho Perez. This is like Real Housewives of wherever for electrical engineers. Uh, This is the Y50 ohms uh, video, which is one of my most popular uh, videos. Um, Liquid fear. Wouldn't a duplexer for two antennas clean up the signal too? Actually, no. Um, The duplexer um, allows the two meters to go to the two meter part. And then the other half of it is like 300 megahertz and up. Okay, so you'd end up with, um, if you use the two meter part of it, you'd get the two meter part of it out the two meter antenna. But any harmonics might go out the UHF antenna. 
So uh, go back and take a look at duplexers and what they do. Um, some are different from others. And if they're very, very carefully tuned filters, um, they will stop all the other harmonics. The problem is that those duplexers, the big coils, the cylinders and coils, is are extremely narrow band. So if you want to tune to a different VHF frequency, you're going to have to retune the duplexer. The other type of duplexer that you can get is uh, where you have a 440 antenna and a 2 meter antenna, and you want to connect the both to the same radio, uh, which is a dual band radio. Of course, you can do the opposite. You can have a 2 meter radio and a 440 radio feeding in together going out to a dual band antenna. Um, you know, I have one of those uh, duplexers. I should uh, go and test it with the uh, 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 spectrum analyzer and see what happens. Um, this is the inverted V again, my long element of a 1080 meter OCFD is about 120 degrees. Short leg about 90. Uh, not sure how better or worse could be, but okay for you. Okay for him. Generally, it's significantly better than my non-resonant vertical. Once in a while, the vertical is better on 15, 12, and 10 meters. Uh, the classic non-resonant vertical is the 43-foot vertical, uh, which needs a tuner right at its base. Um, now he's got an off-center fed dipole. And it's uh, working for him. A, I'm not going to argue with success if it works for you. Uh, that's what you want. Now, there's two ways that you sense how your antenna is working. Uh, one, uh, SWR just gives you an indication of whether it's accepting or rejecting your RF. Uh, and the other is how well you feel like you're being heard uh, by other people. If uh, you can hear people calling CQ, but they don't hear you, and this happens repeatedly, uh, you might look at your antenna. Uh, it might be that some power is getting lost somewhere. Jeep and ham radio. Uh, this is from that TJ Brute. I solved this problem with the Comet CA2X4SR, NMO version. Half-wave antenna. The antenna mount is bolted to the tire carrier. It's not the lowest SWR, but I'm well below 2 to 1 across both 2 meters and 70 centimeters. Well, you're fine. I'll have to look into that because I've got a similar problem. My Jeep has the plastic roof. So, uh, very good. Uh, thanks, uh, TJ. Appreciate that. Uh, back to the in, in, in inverted V. So I'm in Indiana with an Alpha Delta 20 meter dipole. Uh, I've worked all states on 20 meters except my own state. That's a problem on 20 meters. You get a pretty large skip zone. And you're not going to get anything much closer than 300 to 400 miles, except rarely. Uh, and the thing you could do is a vertical, if you can put up a vertical or temporary vertical. Um, I've run run it flat top, inverted V, sloping, changed its height and direction multiple times, everything I think to do. You think cranking the angle to 60 degrees might do something to help. It's got more here. I know the stations are there, and I am aware 20 meters isn't ideal for this close-up work, but there's got to be a way. Um... I would suggest turning your Alpha Delta, if I remember how they're made, there's screw contacts in the middle, uh, turning that into a fan dipole with 15 and 10 hanging off the bottom of it and see what happens when you do that. See if that'll help you get on some of these other bands. What you really need is a 40 meter dipole. Now, Alpha Delta does make a dipole that will do 40 as well as these other frequencies. Um, one thing you can look at is the MFJ2010. The MFJ2010 is the reference station antenna. It covers all of 40, all of 20, also 10 and 6. 
um, and it's less than $100, so it's pretty inexpensive. That could really uh, give you a lot of help for those closer in stations. Uh, let's see, Mark uh, Holzer, uh, Jeep and Ham Radio. Hello, Dave. Really enjoy your talks. Nice refresher for me as I have not been operating for the last 15 years. But I am back and am intrigued with the POTUS soda stuff. What a great idea. I've already built my NFED half-wave antenna in 49 to 1. Unun the antenna rocks. Flat as pancake on 20. Working on my 40 meter extension. In the low 7s, I'm getting 2 to 1. No good. By the way, I have that very antenna. Which one? Oh, the one he's talking about here. And I believe I have the mag mount, which I don't use. Are you interested? Won't cost you anything but the shipping, if that sounds fair. We can get it done. I might do that. So here's a question. Uh, I have in my shack in the middle of my garage. So any runs to good earth ground would require a very long strap to where I could drive a copper snake. So I thought I would try something. I drilled into the garage floor about halfway through, ran a strap from a lead anchor to my systems. I'm not sure, but it sounds a lot quieter. And tuning up is much easier, achieving one-to-one -one through the tuner in 20 and 40. Um, does that make any sense? It does sort of, there's a couple things you can do here. One, drill all the way through the garage floor, just put ground rod through. Uh, second, if you come across a piece of rebar in your garage floor, attach to that and uh, use it as a sort of an oofer ground. Um, and what you're doing right now, now you say you're using lead. Um, one thing you can do with the lead is put your ground wire down in there and then fill the hole with lead. And that would give you good contact all the way through. Try and get as much dust out of there as you can. But fill it with lead. That's a little dangerous. I mean, if you're a plumber, you know how to do this. For other people to deal with smel or melting lead, uh, you need to recall that the fumes from the melting lead are poisonous. And it's not the kind of poison that goes away. It gets into your brain and the, the body, you know how the periodic table works, the body will just wants to get something from that column in the periodic table and it might normally take calcium, but it can also take the one below it. And that's how the poisoning kind of occurs. But um, yeah, the, the thing would work and if that's giving you uh, good stuff, then good. I would go ahead and run the copper strap uh, along the floor, not where the tires go over it, but along the floor, taped down if you have to, and outside the garage to a real ground rod. The reason you want that is it gives you a little extra for lightning protection. Also, you want to bring your antenna leads down to that ground rod before they come into the garage. Okay, um, this is looking at, from Terrence, two Echo Zero India Papa Kilos 16 hours ago. And we've got a, a, a view in the backyard here testing the ARRL NFED half-wave antenna. We've done three videos on that now. And in the last video, we extended it to 80 meters and did the modification that puts it on 75 without having to change anything on 40 through 10. And uh, works great. Uh, that video will be up soon. Now, yes, what's the property behind me? Directly behind me, across the barbed wire fence, is Billy Creek State Wildlife Area. And uh, in the distance is Mount Sneffels, elevation 14,150 feet, depending on whom you believe. Patriot 945 says, the reason it takes longer for some of us to get up is because we have more assembly. Let's see, review of the Quan Shang 
UVK5. Okay, uh, I'm not sure I understand the comment. It's a review of a radio. And because we have more assembly. Okay. Glenn Martin says, thank you, Dave. And zero QFT, interesting results. That's on our inverted V. Uh, N0 VTY, I've always dropped my inverted Vs for lowest SWR and went um, with it. And Fed half wave works pretty good as an inverted V2. Both statements true. If you have an antenna at the height of a half wave, the feed point impedance runs about 70 ohms. As you bring it down, you will go through a point where it's 50 ohms. And if you go below that, it'll actually drop the uh, feed point all the way down to 30, something like 30, is what I found on this thing. Not sure if I mentioned that in the video or not, but it did change the SWR. Uh, Tom Bagley, 18 hours ago, said that was the best conclusion ever. Just get something in the air. Oh, very nice. Very good. John, KC4LZN. I have Always loved an inverted V antenna, and it is always proven to be very good in operation. Well, not always at a half wavelength, been very successful with a minimum of a quarter length of the ground. 90 degrees has always been my focus, and do your and do find your results interesting, as it appears there is a bit of fudging allowed to that point. The one can get out in the air and just work the stations and surprise the rest with your accomplishment. The Wyndham is one of my all-time favorites. There are all kinds of antennas. You stick it up in the air and somebody's done it that way before, probably in the hundred years of ham radio. But I just wanted to do that study on the inverted V because I wanted that. It's a question that's always bothered me. Just a standard length antenna and try it at different central angles and see what it does to the antenna. The answer is some, but not that much. You can make it work. Steve Schroeder, who is a friend of mine from our local ham club. Uh, Dave, how high above the grounds are the ends of the antennas? Steve, if you look uh, early in the video, I show the uh, wires charts uh, in there, and that shows for each of the antennas how high off the ground the ends of the antennas are. Uh, Joseph uh, Gomez, while well, very surprising results. Dave, great idea and test. Thank you. Dave, uh, AC3HT, has used the feature to attach a couple dollars for channel funds. Uh, to the comment and he just simply says thanks and I say thank you also uh, base angler bass angler the most forgiving antenna you can have in my opinion yeah inverted V's have been popular for years Ralph uh, 20 years ago great episode Dave I wonder what effects the feeding system would have direct coax or ladder line um, it's not going to affect the radiation pattern. Um, it's There's three ways of feeding this antenna. The most common way by far is to take coax, put the center line of the coax to half the antenna, and the uh, braid to the other half the antenna. That's a balanced to unbalanced right there, and that's going to result in the outside of the jacket of the coax, the the braid, to radiate. Um, but that's been done for a long time. I mean, it really works. The second way you can make it is to put a one-to-one -one ballon. And there are two kinds of one-to-one -one ballons. One is just a transformer. And the other is just to put some ferrite beads on that uh, antenna lead, the coax, right up near the base that will stop radiation from going down the outside of the braid. And the 
effect of that is to act as a one to one balance to unbalanced. Okay, and then of course the other way is to feed it with balanced life. Uh, now this is only a 50 ohm input. You could you know, do some sort of a little transformer up there or play some games with reactants. Uh, but then you'd have to have a tuner somewhere. A four to one ballon is not the right ballon. You need a nine to one ballon if you want to put a ballon at the feed line. Because if you take 450 and divide it by 50, that's nine to one. Okay, a lot of people throw a one to one or a four to one ballon in there and think it's great. It's not. Okay. Uh, 9 to 1 ballon uh, would be best. So there are many different ways of feeding a dipole. The one I use the most is coax direct to the antenna. It's cheap. Um, it is considered not to be best practice, but a lot of the uh, people um, like, a lot of the people you know, just like the fact that it's inexpensive. So there you go. Okay, Tom Bartman, great video, new radio operator here, and I put an inverted V in the attic with a 60 watt 10 meter radio for my first one. My first contact from Philadelphia was in Scotland. Very good. And uh, says I could only get about 120 degrees out of the downward slope. No, well, there you go. If it works, 10 meters is highly unpredictable, but can yield some great DX. That is true. Um, you might be interested in checking out VK3YE, what frequency, how far. Yeah, VK3YE is a, an Australian with an interesting uh, YouTube channel with a strong bias toward QRP. And he loves his Magloop antennas. And he's interesting to listen to. Best of all round HF antenna, off center fed, inverted V. That will work too. Low Q, a bit noisy, directional gain on the higher bands, a bit of a gamble, a bit deaf off the short end. Typical antenna, really, except, of course, very broad banded, relatively cheap. Yeah. Amateur radio operators, if you find a group of three amateur radio operators, they will have at least four different opinions on antennas. Which antenna works for them? Which antenna is best? It's like saying, what's better, an orange or a kumquat? And the answer is, some like one, some like the other, some like both. Some don't like both. Okay, there are many different types of antennas that hams have used, and the reason they're still around is because they work. And they work well enough for people to make contacts. Right now, I have uh, um, three HF antennas. I've got the hex beam, which is not permanently mounted, but certainly not intended to move. Then I have my uh, step IR, big IR vertical, which is mounted out there with literally a few dozen radials on the thing. That's not going anywhere. And then I've got this one, they just put up the ARRL uh, 40 through 10 in fed antenna that I extended to 80 meters, proved that it worked, and I also made the little modification that's in the May uh, Ask Dave column in QST. That is uh, 75 there without affecting the 40 through 10. Now the one problem I have with that antenna is that the capacitor, which is three kilovolts is not very hefty. And I don't know how much current it will be able to handle without blowing. So needless to say, I'll be doing some experiments. 
The other thing to consider is that the antenna was designed for 40 through 10. So the toroids in there may not like the 3.5 megahertz, which may cause heat in there. So we'll see how that runs. I would say run it at uh, lower power. Uh, okay, low Q, yeah. Every antenna has problem. Stephen Miles, gotta love the BBC. It's a shame you trust British Broadcasting over U.S. Broadcasting. I always have. I always have. Uh, the U.S. broadcaster that we listen to is NBC, Lester Holt. Um, occasionally, when that's not available, we'll go with ABC, which is David Muir. Um, I find both of those sources trustworthy. The thing about them is they have only so much time, so therefore only so many stories they can pick. And their bias is shown by what they leave out also. They are like any news organization. The more blood, guts, and gore, the more it's likely it's going to be covered. So, um, you know, it's standard journalism. You know, while we're on the subject of, of journalism, Fox News has been very much in the news recently. Uh, there are even more right-wing <clears throat> populist kind of uh, channels. We forget that America has a fine and outstanding tradition of highly biased news. Um, back in the, around the turn of the ninth, uh, 20th century, so 120 years ago, uh, there was a guy by the name of William Randolph Hearst and he owned a bunch of papers where he sensationalized everything. And in sensationalizing everything, what he did was, in essence, he, um, he, he sensationalized everything. And, and what he did was uh, actually... Oh, well, let me put it this way. There are a lot of historians who think that the Spanish-American War existed only on the front pages of William Randolph Hearst's newspaper in New York. But um, now that, that particular news media empire is long gone. But um, this idea of fear-mongering, catering to the lowest common denominator... Uh, telling people what they want to hear, and so on. That tradition is still very much alive. We see it in uh, the supermarket periodicals, and we see it in uh, television shows that um, will, you know, tell you what you want to hear. So, and then there has always been trustworthy uh, newspapers, and every trustworthy newspaper has made its share of mistakes so but i do trust the bbc for world news better than i do our own first of all you get a lot more of it uh, american news rarely covers foreign stories you know a bus crash that kills 50 people in india will get coverage in american news the fact that uh, india just made a, a great step forward in GDP per individual won't get covered. So, one of those things. KS, the backlight on this radio stays on while scanning and there seems to be no way to turn that off. That irks me so much. Such an oversight. I tweeted Quan Sheng about it. They said the demand is low so they won't be providing firmware updates for now, but will tell us later. Yeah, that was strange. I'd never... Um, looked at a Quan Cheng uh, radio before. The UV means 2 meters and 70 centimeters, or UHF, VHF. Okay, and um, I mean, it was a radio. 
<laughs> Modeling results for the cockeyed inverted V. Oh, this was a fun one. Um, now, I did not put this into um, my column, asked Dave, because I had answered a similar question about six months earlier. But this is the bottom line. It is amazing how flexible antennas are and can still work. Get something in the air. Okay, and Jay on the same thing. Interesting, I did this and noticed the same SWR readings as having it straight, yeah. Now, don't forget, um, SWR is a measure of how much of the power you put out gets back to your radio. Uh, as antennas become less optimum, they start to get more, turn more of that power into heat. But I think in the case of the so-called cockeyed vertical, which is a regular inverted V, but with one leg bent back, so it's at right angles to the other. Uh, it's a very interesting question, and I modeled it. Um, behind your house. The GT5R is the same radio. However, it is, and I verified this in my spectrum analyzer, the front end for transmit filters out almost all uh, the significant part of the um, spurious emissions at higher frequencies. So yeah, otherwise it is the same radio. You can use the UV5R software for it as stated in the video. Okay. Uh, let's see, modeling results for cockeyed. Uh, what modeling software are you using? I looked online, but didn't see the program that you were using. Thanks in advance. Thanks for the videos. Well, let's just go take a peek. I'm going to go in here and look up, uh, what's the name of that software? E Z N E C. Okay, there it is right there. Let's click through, see if it's still there. Yep. Free, 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 free. Okay. Get your antenna software. It's available for free. So that is the software I am using. Uh, and it does work uh, quite well. Let me just pull this over a little bit. Okay. Uh, ignore, let's see, G-O, this is the UK, ignoring the balanced, unbalanced issue with the low impedance of that antenna and the low frequency of the losses with coax may be better than ladder line. I'm an advocate of ladder line open wire feeder, but it's not automatically lower loss. Uh, for that inverted V, there is no real reason not to feed it with um, just um, just plain old uh, uh, ladder line because um, the line losses due to poor SWR in ladder line are far less, far less than line losses in coax feeding a high SWR. But if the SWR is low, why do that? You end up with balance you've got to deal with and so on. Uh, Joseph DeRose says, thank you. Roger LaFrance, even more space savings is a horizontal square and even better NVIS with a reflector counterpoise. Yeah, it's good for straight up for NVIS on 1840. 20, you start to get stuff going out you get a really strange uh, output pattern on 20 meters. It's got many, many, many lobes. So, uh, but it does work. I've used it. Dave, sorry about your dental troubles. Love the education. Well, thank you very much. 
I uh, appreciate that. Um, the uh, dental trouble is much better now. Um, I go in this coming week to, they're going to adjust the dentures so that um, I can um, use them properly. I'm using them now, but there's a great big hole up there and food gets caught in it like crazy. Okay, Rick Dykstra says, why didn't you show the azimuth pattern? I think that's what he was asking. Yeah, he was. He was. Um, it doesn't change. Um, they're nearly identical. Um, now, again, I uh, I did a, a, a uh, beam with root strength was just going to have much bigger. The still squite ball impact. Yeah, I didn't show any of the uh, horizontal patterns. It takes a standard dipole pattern and twists it about 45 degrees and it drops a couple dB in the direction of the arrow and adds a couple dB going the other way. So it's all comes out in the wash. Um, I did do a, this is my collection of the Ask Dave columns. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, I put this here in this so that I can go back through and see if I've already covered something like this. Okay, right here I show um, a dipole that's um, kind of sort of twisted off to the center and you can see what is happening to the uh, radiation pattern right here. It's about the same. Now, I had already answered that in Ask Dave, so I didn't put his question into the, the column. But it was a very interesting question, and I did model it. Okay. Uh, Dave, AC3HT, again, has added $2 to the channel funds with his comment. Yes, you can do the same, and I won't object to it. Um, he says, thanks. This is modeling results for cockeyed inverted V. Glenn Martin, uh, who's in Missouri, says, thank you, Dave, and zero QFT. All that work and 1 dB loss <laughs> increasing. Yeah, yeah, not much. I mean, it, it just goes to prove the idea that you just simply need to uh, do, get some antenna, get something in the air. Excuse me for just a moment. Yeah. My, uh, got a car in for service. Um, now here's an old video. How does a J-pole antenna work? This is Ask Dave number 36. So this is years ago. And this is one of my most popular videos. Great explanation of how J-pole antenna works. What I don't understand is why you don't lose some of the transmit power to the shorted end of the quarter wave section, or do you? You don't. Now, think of that end as a quarter wave um, transmission line stub. And it is a quarter wave, it's 19 inches long ish. Um, put that in there, and it's a quarter wave. So the shorted end, the voltage must be zero. So that means the voltage is a maximum at the other end. And if it's shorted, the current must be max, so the current is zero at the other end. So the impedance at the shorted end is zero. The impedance at the open end is very high. Very high. High enough to end feed a two meter dipole. So that's what the other part of the antenna is. Now the question becomes, you want to feed it. Where along that quarter wave dipole is it 50 ohms? It'll be 50 ohms where the voltage is 50 times uh, the, let's see, equals IR. Um, so R equals E over I, the voltage is 50 times 
the current. And it turns out that you don't have to go very far up to get to 50 ohms. Because remember, if you go up again, you're going to get 100, 1,000, and so on going up. And there's that one spot that's 50 ohms. So at RF, that thing is anything but shorted. It's definitely not shorted. It is the 50 ohm point where you feed it. So that's how that works. Dave, your personality is inviting, calm, relaxed, and highly informative from a ham radio perspective. Thank you. Your channel brings the reality of life experiences and the everyday happenings into a very enjoyable experience from a guy that would be your best next door neighbor. No politics, no right, left, no not knowing. No not knowing what bathroom to go to, so on. This guy talking about ham radio. Thank you. Thank you very much from NH7TR. I appreciate that. And that was a comment on a live stream. Craig B., I just got my tech license, and out of everybody I watch, you give the best explanation. Thanks. This is for RFI in the shack. Thank you very much. Robert Luke Hessen. Most of the time it is hypothetical, the losses. Every extra connector loses some signal and increases SWR. True. Not much, but true. Every meter of cable has the same effect. Eventually, you'd be better off without an external antenna to get best results with the tiny telescope aerial receiving. Spending several grand to get the SWR right. If you want to receive signals from Alaska or ISS, yes, that may be necessary. Suddenly, AI shows us the best antenna design, and that will shock us. I don't know. I've never tried asking. Uh, I've used BARD on Google quite a bit. I really like it. You can ask it more complex questions. Uh, you can ask it like, give me the pros and cons of such and such, and it'll do it. <laughs> it's really BARD.Google.com. Um, now, let me talk about at what point you don't want your transmitter in your shack. When you start to move into microwave frequencies, you are better off moving both the receiver front end and the transmitter final out to the feed point of the antenna. Now we're talking up in the microwave range relay, okay. Um, the point is that even with microwave uh, waveguide, uh, if you're at 44 megahertz, a piece of waveguide that long will cost you half your signal. So you move it so that the output of the antenna is the little dipole that is at the horn that then feeds the reflector. Um, so you move the receiver in by means of putting a parametric or other very low noise amplifier right at the feed point of the antenna. And then if you're going to transmit, you move the transmitter. Usually you will transmit up to it some much lower frequency. You will have a transverter up at the uh, where the transmitter is to double, triple, quadruple, whatever that signal and then you'll have the final amplifier directly feeding the antenna element. Okay, and that is how it is done in radio telescopes. If you look at your dish antenna or your um, whatever the Hughes one is, um, well, dish antenna, you will look, you will discover that the preamps are right at the pickup point. That cable that comes down into your house does not contain the actual RF. It contains the so-called baseband. And there's a lot of interaction between that and uh, what you have in, in your system. So, yeah, you, you've got to keep the, um, as you get higher and higher in frequency, you need to keep 
the transmitter and receiver, meaning the parametric amplifier and probably a down converter, and then an up converter and your final stage right up in the antenna. Does that make for some awkward things? Oh, yeah, of course. But you just don't have transmission lines in those systems. The, the coax moves a much lower frequency uh, system. So, yeah, that works. Um, the Jeep versus ham radio, they also make mounts that install behind the rear taillights. They work well on the Jeep Wrangler. I'll have to take a look at that. I've got a 2018 Jeep Wrangler. David Hoover includes $10 with his comment and says thanks. And then he uh, goes back to his own comment and says, Thanks, Dave, for each Ask Dave video you present all these years. They are greatly appreciated. Best wishes from KD0FDF. Thank you very much, David. I greatly appreciate that. Um, Johnny Big Potato says, uh, Lovely out these days. It is, definitely. Phil Baker says, Excellent video, Dave. Reactants versus capacitance. A look at Breedlove mounts, pricey but well-engineered. Okay. I uh, have to look at an auto parts store or something. There are half-wave mobile antennas that don't need a ground plane, but I've put a lot of 5 8 wave antennas on headache racks, and as such, they work fine. Even some thin wire silicone to the roof would help. If you want to get crazy, Gam Electronics has two half-wave in-phase mobile's 2-meter antennas. Okay. Thanks for the info. Uh, Gregory Eisenberg, I'm not satisfied with these answers. Balcony antenna possibilities. There must be some dipole or wire antenna that can be set up on a two-floor apartment balcony will access to the HF bands. Otherwise, antenna technology is still in its infancy. Actually, antenna technology is remarkably mature. And nobody is looking at HF antenna technology except the amateur builders. This is where the antenna technology work is. It's on the phone. Because inside this thing is a multi-band antenna that has to work on multiple bands. And they put a lot of work. Some of these have what they call fractal antennas. There was an article years ago in QST about a fractal antenna for 40 meters. In general, the dipole is the name of the game. Now, you can play lots of games with phased arrays and stuff like that, which become easier to do at these higher frequencies. But the fact of the matter is that you want your um, antenna to give you 50 ohms with a dipole. Now, you can try bending dipoles up and around and stuff like that. But size is a factor. Size matters. Once you get up to 20 meters, you can start doing kind of weird little wrap jobs but by and large, um, a, if it's a concrete building, that's like trying to transfit from underground. It doesn't work real well. Because concrete is, after all, artificial rock. Um, so, Gregory, I understand you're not satisfied. Take that s dissatisfaction and turn it into research and turn it into testing and trying and experimenting, okay? There are antennas that do work on balconies like uh, the MFJ balcony antenna. Um, might get a buddy pole in there, might. Um, you can put a mag loop antenna. I mean, there are things you can do, but the fact of the matter is that Living on a second floor apartment with a balcony 
is a non-optimal situation for HF antennas. Um, setting up station with an amplifier, I tried to watch, I really did. The unsteady camera work bothered my gut. Okay, I have already passed this feedback on to my assistant. Uh, there is a feature in the editing software that can remove the unsteadiness. Um, and we've taken to placing the camera on a tripod when we need to use it in an odd place. So uh, we did get this criticism from quite a few people um, and have made changes since to try and keep it more reasonable. Sorry about the uh, uh, unsteady camera work. Hope you're... <laughs> I just keep a barf bag <laughs> handy there. Uh, as an aircraft owner, I have several of them available. Ron Bean, and this is installing Anderson power pole connectors. One question. Um, when inserting the pin into the housing, should the spoon point up or down? Each of the things that you insert have a little lip on the edge, a little lip. And there's a piece of metal in there and you insert it so that the lip goes down over the piece of metal that's in there. Okay, if it's turned up, it's upside down. But that little lip comes down like this. So I guess that's what you're referring to as the, the spoon. Um, if you look at advertising for power pole connectors, they will show you how they're done properly. It's, you'll see that there's a little lip and then the upper part comes in that actually makes contact with the other power pole. Okay, uh, run. This is Rick Dykstra again. You showed a chassis mounted 239. Not one designed for an antenna mount. Not the same thing. Look at Diamond for a good mount. Chassis mount 239. Uh... I'm not following you. Is that an antenna? Um, the problem uh, with the Jeep is the plastic roof. The plastic roof with a couple of just simple hand turns here will allow you to take the roof clean off. And the it's designed for that so that you can go out in the sun and fun in your Jeep. You can even put the windshield down. I mean, it's an amazing vehicle. But anyway, let's see. Um, okay, I'll have to look at that. I used a marine MO mount designed for fiberglass boats. It has a rubber seal outside, stainless steel bolts and washers, and four radials inside under the fiberglass roof. I think it was by Larson. I'll have to take a look at that. Uh, Mike says, My pickup, uh, where are we on time? Oh, my. My pickup doesn't have enough roof space for a good two meter antenna. What I have instead is an aluminum bracket screwed into one of the bolts that holds my fender and quarter panel on it. Sticks out from under my hood, roughly where my FM radio antenna is, but on the driver's side, it's got a good ground from the fender. Um, right into the frames mechanically sound. Might work the same for the Jeeps. Thanks. Take a look for that. I'll have to go down to the auto parts store about this. Um, center insulator, insulator for dipoles. Uh, CL says, thank you. You helped me gain further understanding. Well, I'm glad. Brad Peace, what was your final wire length on this video? I didn't measure it, but I think it's close to... 130 to 132 feet. Okay, so now the ARRL is the creator of the 49 to 1 auto transformer. They just want the credit for everything these days. Good grief. If you buy a gallon of milk at King Supers, does that make King Supers the creator of the milk? Good grief, no. They resell. And ARRL is doing the same thing. They're reselling an antenna made by somebody else. 
Now, is it okay if King Supers puts their brand name on the milk? Of course it is, because they've got their own facilities where they can fill bottles. In this case, they got the other company to make them for them. What the ARRL did was translate the manual from metric into imperial units, okay, feet, inches, and so on. And it added a little text here and there where the original manual didn't have it. Okay, so they put some value add into it, plus they have them in stock, uh, and they're selling them as kits. You know, no vendor of any kind is obligated to sell only what they make in their own back shop. Um, nobody does. There's a supply chain behind everything. And these antennas, I think, I don't have the paperwork in front of me, were made by RF kits. And I looked up and got their instructions, and I like the league ones better. So that's what we put it up as. Now, why did, why did the league make it a 40 through 10 antenna? Very simple. Very few hams have the space for 132 foot long antenna. I do because I live on an acre. It's 206 feet by 206 feet. Okay, and it's almost square. Um, so that antenna fits there for testing. And I've talked a little bit about that, too. So we're going to end here. We are up to 57 minutes. That's quite it's going to be a long video. So um, uh, there you have it. All right, let's turn that off and go back to looking over here at what we are recording. And I want to say thank you very much for joining in this week's commentariat. Um, I hope that you've listened to all or part of it. And uh, can, if you feel um, the urge to support the channel, you can do that at dcastler.com slash support. Find a way that works for you. I'm kind of pushing Patreon these days. Uh, it seems to be a very good method uh, for doing that. You can also put a comment up and put some support in there too with a dollar or two or whatever you may want to do. It all adds up and it enables me to keep doing these videos. So I'm going to say thank you very much to all of you. You are as much a part of this channel as I am. We do this thing together and I love you for it. Appreciate you greatly. Until we next meet, 73.